Hello, everyone, and welcome. I am John Kasparian, the Interim Dean of Architecture, and it is my great pleasure and privilege to welcome you to the first of our fall lectures. This is the first series to be held entirely remotely. So while I can't see you, I know that we had over 275 registrants, a much larger number than we are normally able to accommodate in our Farish Gallery. So uh, welcome. Um, for the first time in years in the school, the fall lecture series has been organized by a committee of faculty, staff, and students and chaired by assistant professors Sarah Nichols and Brittany Udding. The theme of our series, Race, Social Justice and Allyship, is a very first step in our response to the legitimate and timely concerns of alumni and students, including faculty and staff, to act decisively in implementing long-term change in the ways we recruit, educate, and foster future generations of architects and to forcefully address racial and social injustice and all oppressing issues that confront us in these strange and unprecedented times. I'm very much looking forward to our conversations throughout the semester and seeing all of you, and I hope many more, join us in them. I will now ask Sarah and Brittany to formally introduce the program. Thank you. Thank you, John, and hello, everyone. Um, my name is Brittany, and on behalf of the Lectures Committee and co-chair Sarah Nichols, I would like to welcome you all to this first lecture of the fall semester. I want to begin by thanking the faculty and staff, Interim Dean John, our amazing student representatives, and especially our communications team for working so hard during the summer to make this lecture series and our new digital format happen. The Rice Architecture Fall 2020 Lecture Series on Race, Social Justice, and Allyship is part of a school-wide initiative to keep the focus on systemic racism and injustice brought by the Black Lives Matter protests across the world, acknowledging the physical violence against Black people, as well as the political, social, and economic violence often inscribed in space. We've invited designers, scholars, and activists to speak on the relationship between space, race, and power, acknowledging architecture as a site on which social equity, climate justice, class struggle, and as we have witnessed this year, public health are intertwined and often decided. Recognizing the spatial dimension of racism and the profound urgency for designers to act, the aim of this lecture series is to set the agenda for future solidarity, allyship, and action in architecture. So I would like to welcome and thank Mickey Hebel, for joining us this first, for the, as the first speaker of this lecture series with her workshop titled, How Individuals and Organizations Can Reduce Racism. Mickey is the Martha and Henry Malcolm Lovett Professor of Psychology and Professor of Management here at Rice University. And her research focuses on the subtle ways that, that discrimination persists in our everyday lives, from microaggressions to embedded biases. She helps organizations recognize these pervasive, pervasive forms of discrimination, and works with them to find new formats of allyship. So before we turn this over to Mickey, a quick note on the Q&A. Uh, we are hosting this lecture as a webinar. So after the talk, all participants can ask questions by typing them in the Q&A box that you should see at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Our graduate student representative, Mai Okimoto, will read them out loud for the audience to hear and so that Mickey can address them. We'll do our best to get to all of the questions, but apologies if we run out of time. All right. So I'd like to turn this over to Mickey. Thank you again and welcome. Welcome. Um, I want to say this is a crazy format. Um, I am actually speaking to you from Boulder, Colorado. So uh, I'm, I hear that there are people joining us from all over and I welcome each of you. I want to start by thanking John. Um, John, thank you for taking this topic seriously, for bringing it into architecture and for inviting me to be the first speaker. Um, the first speaker is, is always an easy, easy thing to do because there's no standard. So I'm now going to be the standard. So thank you again. And Sarah and Brittany, thank you to you as well. Um, so to the undergrads turning, tuning in, to the graduate students, to the faculty in architecture, welcome. 
to the members of the RDA. I have been to so many RDA galas and I'm so supportive of the RDA community. Um, thanks in large part to my husband. So <laughs> uh, I also am, am just very uh, welcoming to the rice community and to the academic communities that are joining us today. So here we are, here we are in August of 2020 and we find ourselves in unprecedented waters. So we have this COVID pandemic and sooner or later it's gonna hit each of us in some way. I found out three days ago that my beloved brother um, has COVID. He's up in a small town in Wisconsin um, and I'm just very stressed out about it. Uh, he fits a lot of categories of people who get very ill from it. And so I am sure that in, of the 275 of you, many of you have had it yourselves, or you have loved ones or friends who have had it. And I am thinking about you. I'm thinking about the frontline workers um, where there is certainly racial disparities in who's getting it and who's dying from it. It's a very, very stressful time for so many people. Um, we are also in the middle of a racial reckoning where we are seeing protests, we are seeing um, attention poured on racial uh, disparities that have existed from the inception of our history uh, as the United States. And we are really seeing them bubble up like never before. We also, as David Lebron uh, so aptly put, are in the middle of a xenophobic reckoning too, where we are showing nationalism in ways that we've never seen. And in showing the nationalism, we're also showing our fear and dislike of people from other countries. And so this is another pandemic and we're really seeing this in our student population at Rice and at other institutions where many of our international students can't even join our community because they can't get back to the US. And, and there's many different reasons for this, but again, another sort of pandemic. For all of us, or most of us, we also have election stress. And I don't think it matters what side of uh, the, the coin you're on, um, it feels like a very polarized world and a world where um, we no longer have a buffet of sort of ideas that we can choose from, but rather if we watch this news station, we have these views. And if we watch this news station, we have these views and we've become very polarized and intolerant of the other side. And so I think regardless of what side you're on, um, there's just a lot of stress over who's gonna be, what's gonna happen in these next few months and who's gonna lead our country in 2021. And as if that's not enough, we have Lady Laura coming our way. Now, I have recently learned that Lady Laura, and this is of relevance to us too, because we were planning on coming back this week. And so we've aptly said, well, we'll put that back a little bit. But I hear that Lady Laura is not going to hit, this is the hurricane for those of you who don't live in the South, but um, it's going to turn a little bit to Lake Charles. So we're really thinking about our neighbors to the east and, and hoping that it isn't as bad as it looks on uh, television. So in essence, if you're feeling stress, if you're feeling psychological distress or health distress, you are not alone. We have seen over the last few years and certainly over the last few months lots of cases of psychological distress go up. And it's really important for each of us to take inventory. I'm not a clinician, okay, all of this, and I'm not a clinician. I can't tell you if you're crying, I might be able to say, well, you might be depressed, but I'm not that kind of psychologist. But what I can tell you is it's really important to take inventory and to get into routines and make sure we're taking care of ourselves and of our loved ones and of our community. 
So with that, I will just say I'm, I'm um, really um, somewhat happy that a racial reckoning is taking place because I think it's long overdue. And I personally have been studying these issues um, for a very long time, for 25, more than 25 years. So I'll just tell you a tiny bit about myself and how I came to this, because you might be looking at this and saying, well, what does a white lady know about race? And I will tell you, well, this white lady knows a lot about diversity and discrimination, because that is what my area of research is. So I can't personally know it, but I can know it through the research I do and read, and that's my scholarship. So I started out um, uh, growing up in Partyville, Wisconsin. This is, uh, yes, it's called Partyville, and it's a town of 1,300 people. It's in the middle of nowhere actually it's kind of it's kind of close to madison one may it, one day it might be a suburb right now it's the sticks but it's about 50 miles north of madison and partyville is the home of the u.s watermelon speed eating seed spitting championship of the world and these germans come to town every year and they hawk these seeds like you've never seen and so it's kind of a fun place to be second sunday in september if you ever get to partyville so it's a pretty white community, um, but my father is one of 17 children, 17. So I have 55 cousins on just one side, 55 first cousins. And so I would say that even though it was a pretty white family in a white town that I grew up in, one thing I learned very on is inclusion is that there is always room at the table for one more. And during family get togethers, our table was the ping pong table because it was big enough to fit all the kids around it at the time. So I think very early on, I learned about inclusion and just always feeling like, look, there is room for everybody. And when you have a family of 17, 16 siblings, and 55 first cousins, there's kind of one of everything. And if there isn't one of everything, then they marry one of everything. And so really lots of diversity. The thing that I did that was a little bit weird is I went to college in, at Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts. And uh, this is an all women's college and a very liberal feminist um, institution. So. Um, after four years there, I really learned an appreciation of gender issues and of all the things that the women pioneers did and the men pioneers, because when people were marching, when women were marching to get the vote in 1920, um, they were doing incredibly dangerous things at the time and risking their lives so that the women after them, because they knew they weren't gonna realize, most of them knew they weren't gonna realize it in their own time, but they were looking forward to generations after them realizing equality. And I think there's some real parallels um, in the women's movement and in what's going on right now. And I think, um, you know, there were these really important women and men who marched and did things to allow us to have a, a more equity allowed me to be here giving this talk. Um, and so I thought a lot about that at Smith after four years of being at an all women's college, you really gain an appreciation for gender related issues. And I decided I wanted to go to graduate school in gender uh, to do gender studies. I went into a field called social psychology. And I was pre-med before that, and I took physics, and physics was super hard for me. So to, just to make matters uh, short, uh, I got all the pre-med requirements done except the second, second, second semester of physics. And at that point, I said, I'm, I'm done. My GPA took a little bit of a hit, and so I was applying to graduate school to study then gender issues. And only one school out of the 13 that I applied to accepted me. And so I went, sight unseen, knew nothing about this school. I went to Texas A&M. 
So if there's people out there going, gig em, yep, I'm a little bit of an Aggie. Now I will tell you that coming from Partyville, uh, Wisconsin, and going to Smith College, one of the most liberal feminist places, to Texas A&M, where I believe it's 98% registered Republicans, was a shock to the system, to say the least. <laughs> so I really enjoyed my time at um, A&M, um, but I also realized that the professor I was working for was not a good match for me, and it was hot in Texas, and, and College Station was a unique place. And so what I did is I said, you know, I'm gonna leave Texas and I don't think I'm gonna come back. And what I've learned is you never say, you never say those sorts of things. You never make ultimatums. So I said, I'm not gonna come back to Texas. I went up to Dartmouth and I finished my degree. I got my PhD at Dartmouth in social psychology, which is the study of the way people think about influence and interact with others. And I went on the job market and I got a job at Rice University, and that was 22 years ago. So when you say never, I'm never coming back to Texas, you should never say nevers, okay? So I've been at Rice for 22 years, and I study diversity and discrimination. I look at ways that discrimination is manifested, and I particularly focus not on the overt types of discrimination, although I know those very well, but my research tends to be on the more subtle displays of discrimination. So I think about it as sort of incivilities. So if you think about somebody you don't like, okay, and you can all think about that person right now, um, what sorts of things do you do to that person when you see them coming down the hall? And, you know, I can tell you, you avoid eye contact, you hurry up, you do something called um, a sort of amygdala response, which is like a, okay, and sometimes you do a Duchenne smile, so you see this person and you go, and then you go, hi, and so you couple those together, and as social animals and social processors, we're really able to to see those sort of subtle types of microaggressions, okay? But it's not just that, it's like we may also um, uh, tilt away, we have body positions. Um, we actually try to get out of the conversation as much as possible and as soon as possible. The students tell me that they actually put their cell phone up and pretend that they're on a fake call so they can just move right by the person. And these are the sorts of microaggressions or what I call subtle types of discrimination. Um, some people call them unconscious bias or implicit bias because in some ways people are aware of them and in others they're not. And they're pretty pervasive. And that's what I study in a lot of detail. And then I also study interventions as well. So how can we make, uh, how can individuals reduce those biases and how can organizations reduce both, both the overt and the subtle types of biases. Um, and there's lots of different ways that they can do this. Um, you're gonna hear a little bit about this in my Juneteenth talk. So I was asked by John to, to give a talk and I thought, well, I just gave this talk um, on Juneteenth, and um, in June, they had a inaugural Juneteenth series of talks at Rice University that were also um, virtual. And I was the ninth out of nine speakers. Now, I will tell you, I make reference to this in the Juneteenth talk, which you're gonna see, is um, I was on the softball team at Smith College. And one of the things you know about the softball team or baseball teams, if you watch you know, Major League Baseball or whatever, is the ninth batter is always the weakest one. <laughs> so when they said, you're going ninth, I got it. <laughs> but actually I got some really nice messages afterward when I used the metaphor, which was you really did a clean up and, and nice job. So uh, I'll take that. But now John put me as the first batter. So I feel like I've really like progressed. And the first batter is a quick batter and they have a high on, bat, on um, base percentage. So I don't know, I'm gonna make a quick little, like just sticking with that metaphor, 
I'm gonna have a little bar and then hopefully your other speakers can get on base too, okay? So that's what I'm gonna say. Now, the way that I think this is gonna work is that you're all gonna get to tune in and see that Juneteenth talk. And then afterward, what I'm gonna do is, um, Mai is going, uh, a graduate student in the architecture department is going to do a Q&A. So all of you get to ask any questions you want about the racial reckoning or uh, anything in the area of DNI. I should tell you also that not only do I do diversity and training research or just research in general on DNI issues, and I don't just do them on subtle biases and discrimination after 22 years, that would get dull. I do it on ally training, I do it on bias training, I do it on almost every group that has faced discrimination. So I can talk specifically not only about race, but also about LGBT, about gender issues, about disability, um, many of the groups that are stigmatized. So I also um, do consulting and work with organizations, whether it's the medical center or um, corporations. Um, I train individuals and then I also train diverse graduate students to be the next generation of PhDs. So that's sort of what I'm like. I'm very, uh, that's sort of what I do. I'm very proud to be at Rice University. I, I think that I'll probably spend my career here. There's only one other place I'd go. And I've already told Stanford whenever they want me, I'm available. But otherwise, I'm gonna be at Rice. <laughs> and so I think that what you're gonna next see is you're going to see the Juneteenth talk. And please think of any questions you have and uh, then you'll share them on the um, chat feature and May will ask them to me and I look forward to answering them. Um, our final speaker this afternoon is Dr. Michelle Mickey Hebel, Professor of Psychology and Management. She holds the Martha and Henry Malcolm Lovett Chair in Psychology. Uh, she is an applied psychologist who is interested in the ways in which social psychological phenomena can be applied to industries and organizations. Specifically, her work focuses on workplace discrimination and the barriers that stigmatized individuals, such as women and ethnic and racial minorities, face in social interactions, the hiring process, business settings, and the medical community. In addition, she addresses ways in which both individuals and organizations might remediate such discrimination. She holds a, a doctorate from Dartmouth College and has more than 100 publications in journal articles, book chapters, and edited books. And her topic is how individuals and organizations can reduce racism. Hello, Rice community. Um, I played softball in college, and they always put the weakest batter in the ninth position. Um, I'm in the ninth position, and I have gone before one heck of an amazing lineup today. Um, but I am just happy to be in the game, and I'm happy to be tuned in with you today on such an important occasion. I thank our dean, I thank our provost, and I thank our president for organizing this Juneteenth lecture series. And I also thank each one of you for tuning in and for being willing to learn and stretch yourself. I've been studying discrimination for 25 years. And I think after 25 years, I should be at the top of my game. I shouldn't discriminate. I should excel at being anti-racist. But I sit before you as someone who tries to be anti-racist, but sometimes fail. And I invite you to and talk to let your own guard down and consider that you too are perhaps a racist at times. We are each a work in progress and I hope this talk will help you move to a good direction. About two weeks ago, I got invited to write an article on racism. And whenever I publish, I always think about my current graduate students. Uh, this time was slightly different. I decided to invite 13 of my former black students from Rice University. 11 of them are now currently holding or almost have their PhDs in psychology. 
They're in academia at schools ranging from Yale to San Luis Obispo to Indiana University. They're in business schools from Creighton's B School to Berkeley's Haas Business School to Columbia's Business School. They include a director of diversity at Allegheny College and a director of diversity at UT's Health Science Center. I also invited a 2020 grad who's dis uh, dedicating himself to spoken word and coaching others. And I invited a current stu student. You might know him as Rice's current impressive Truman Scholar. I invited them because I wanted to lift the voices of young black scholars and because, um, well, they're Rice students and they've worked with me before and I'm no dummy. They're way smarter than I am. However, I feel it's important to tell you that I speak with them rather than for them. In our article, we make five points which I want to share with you. The first three points particularly speak to the context of why we need to reduce racism. And the fourth and fifth points uh, directly address the way in which individuals and organizations can reduce racism. The first point that we would like to make is that many black people are exhausted. It deepens with each new death at the hands of police brutality. It results in reduced productivity, a decreased ability to cope, decreased feelings of self-worth, a desire to zone out, and a lack of getting restorative sleep at night. And if any of you are feeling those things, you are not alone. Importantly, research shows that racism has real psychological and physiological effects, and my colleague Danielle just spoke about some of those. Racism leads to chronic stress, and this chronic, chronic stress is associated with chronic diseases, hypertension, PTSD, depression, and heart disease, just to name a few. What is clear is that Black people are currently in a state of psychological and physiological crisis during which Jennifer Bradder aptly called this morning a tidal wave of racial reckoning. And people seem to be taking a lot of action, but unfortunately many, particularly white people, don't know exactly how best to respond. Many people have written or expressed feelings about their uncertainty of how to act and about their experiences of cognitive dissonance, which is a psychological discomfort. And some common reactions include responses such as, well, I try to treat everyone equally, or I try to do the right thing, or I'm not racist, but why do I feel this discomfort, and how can I possibly make a difference? At a time where it's important not to be silent, my colleagues tell me that there are actually some dumb things you can say. We should avoid saying, I know just how you feel because we don't. Things will get better because they've heard this for decades. There are just some bad apples in the police force because there are more than just some bad apples. The tree seems to have a disease. Or all lives matter because that's shifting the narrative away from the disease, which is racism. And unfortunately, these sorts of comments, which may be well-intentioned, can actually add to the exhaustion and stress that Black people experience. A second point my colleagues make is that racism extends beyond police brutality. It exists in other spheres, housing, the labor market, education, healthcare, and the criminal justice system. And it's cumulative. The disadvantage accumulates across generations. It accumulates across a single domain. A poor elementary education often restricts later education. And it accumulates across domains, as Alex Berg aptly showed this morning, housing often influences education. Research shows that within race differences can be even larger than between race differences. In one of the most disheartening studies I've ever read, Jennifer Eberhardt at Stanford found that black men, particularly those who look more versus less stereotypically black, are more likely to get the death penalty, even after controlling for the severity of the crime. In our own research, we found that highly stereotypically looking people have decreased social networks and re received 
relative to their less stereotypical. And you see how we control for these with the images, with some of the images you see right here. It's terrible that the color of skin in 2020 affects real academic advisors' decisions about which students they recommend for take, taking difficult STEM classes, but that's exactly what we found. These academic advisors from all across the country were less likely to recommend the more versus less stereotypical black women, an example of what you can see here. We found the same pattern for Hispanic men and women. Basically, the more they look white, the better off their, their opportunities are. It's also important to note that racism isn't just the overt discrimination. Racism involves the subtle behaviors too. The unfriendly stares, as you see here, the behind doors gatekeeping that keeps black people out and the microaggressions that Danielle King so clearly explained. These more subtle areas of discrimination are the focus of much of my own research. And these are taxing beyond belief. A third point my collaborators also stress is that even with all the racism that is targeted at them, black people are still blamed for the racism they experience. The American dream and the myth of meritocracy states that if you just work hard enough, you'll succeed. Or if you don't succeed at first, try, try again. And unfortunately, when black people don't make it, too often they're judged as not having worked hard enough, not being good enough, or only awaiting handouts. And if black people upset the status quo, as we so vividly witnessed Colin Kaepernick do over the last two years, they're punished. Colin silently took a knee, and he was vilified as anti-American and blacklisted, an appropriate word, from playing in the NFL. As a discrimination researcher, many people ask me, how can they reduce racism? What can they themselves do? And this is the fourth point that my collaborators and I make. Our education and awareness is paramount to reducing racism. These are actions we can adopt at the individual level. Each of us needs to invest in becoming more aware of African-American history, not the more whitewashed version of it that we've long been given. We need to read the works and words of black and diverse scholars and of all the scholars who are working in this space. I've listed some books that were recommended to me. Perhaps you've read some or might be interested. I just finished How to Be an Anti-Racist. And as an academic, we need to engage in what Ibram Kendi refers to as educational suasion. We try to teach and persuade students to be anti-racist. Related to this, education and awareness often give rise to anti-racist behaviors. Research on effectively reducing racism suggests that we first need to become aware of the problem. That is, all of us are biased. We need to own this. We are all sometimes, perhaps unintentionally, engaging in racist behaviors. We need to sit down and sit with the discomfort this causes us. We need to listen to experts and reflect. And then we need to use that discomfort, that cognitive dissonance, to motivate us into acting. We are not off the hook because we know that everyone else has biases. This is harmful thinking. Instead, we need to realize that we can each be part of the solution. We must be motivated to act. And then we need to look at our options for acting and set goals. Empirical research suggests that goal setting that's most effective and particularly in the sphere of reducing discrimination are goals that are smart. They're specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time bound. What else can we do to reduce racism? One study my student, who is now a professor at Cornell did, uh, was, uh, showed this um, in her undergraduate thesis. She conducted a field study to see how effective allyship behavior is in condemning or condoning discrimination. She asked people walking by on sidewalks to stop and participate in a research study. Their job would be to give their responses to the acceptability of racism, but they had to give their answers after they heard an ostensible participant who was actually an actor in our study either condemn or condone discrimination. Importantly, we found that allyship worked. 
And we replicated this just two years ago. When actors condemned racism, our participants did too. But unfortunately, it also worked the other way. When actors condoned racism, so too did our participants. This finding lasted up to two months later. So modeling allyship is critically important in reducing racism. My colleagues and I have compiled a list of other things that we can do to reduce racism. You might look over this list and hone in on one thing that you can choose as your own goal. What are you willing to commit to? Can you find something? As my colleague Larry Perkins likes to say, diversity and being anti-racist is intentional and deliberate. And when he comes to talk to my class, he points to people and he says sort of like the Lorax by Dr. Seuss, that is up to you. It's up to you and it's up to me. And when he points to people, what he's saying is the burden is on each one of us. So please try to choose something here or elsewhere and make it your SMART goal. And then make it public. Tell someone else what you're planning to do because we know that public commitment increases the likelihood of action. The fifth and final point my colleagues articulate is that we need anti-racist policies and accountability, not empty promises and more empty promises. These actions are steps we can take at the organizational level. I'd ask you to consider, as the authors of this recent Harvard Business Review ask, is your company actually fighting racism or is it just talking about it? It's a good read that I recommend. Certainly many organizations are publicly acknowledging that Black Lives Matter, but we need to hold these organizations, organizations accountable. Where were they four years ago, decades ago? Will they be here tomorrow, in two years? Is this change real or is it only for optics? Two of our impressive graduates of our own IO PhD program, Enrica Ruggs and Derek Avery, wrote a piece recently published in MIT's Sloan Management Review, which I recommend. It describes why organizations simply can no longer afford to stay silent on racial injustice, and I hope you'll read it. I call out two organizations in particular, Nike, who stood by Colin Kaepernick. Granted, Nike made millions off of Kaepernick, but the other one is much more near and dear to my heart. And I admit it, I have a mutant ice cream eating gene. Ben and Jerry's is not just interested in optics. They're the real deal. And four years ago, we did research on their forward thinking statements then. I'd invite you to sit down, maybe with ice cream in hand and spend 30 minutes on the Ben and Jerry's webpage. It's not a one line pro BLM statement. It's not one paragraph, but two screens and many links and articles they have written which declare their anti-racist intentions and recommend to all of us achievable anti-racist actions. Please visit it and see if you agree with me. People also commonly ask me as an organizational psychologist, uh, what can organizations do to reduce racism? In 2016, I felt compelled to respond to a surge of overt racism and uptick in the discrimination that was present in our socio-political climate. And I agreed to teach professional and executive MBAs in the Jones School about diversity management or about how to optimize the future of the workplace. And I wanna go into just very short detail of some of my take home messages based on organization, the organizational theory and empirical research. Organizations who want to be less racist should begin by conducting an organizational needs analysis. What are the needs of that specific organization? These direct the goals and actions of companies. They should consider what a more anti-racist version of themselves would look like and how their organization would benefit. The needs of one organization are not the needs of another, so it's critical for organizations to identify from the start the outcomes that they most want. Organizations that are serious must also get leadership buy-in if they have any chance of being successful with organizational level change. Leaders should ideally not only buy in, but also be in attendance and participating in diversity initiatives. Diversity is not something that should be relegated to and led by HR. And one of the best local leaders I can point to is President Peter Pisters of MD Anderson, 
who talks the talk and walks the walk. And I'd invite you to look at the diversity and inclusion initiatives that he's championed and reinforced right here in Houston. Of course, organizations must have representation and mobility throughout the organization. So not promises of we will have this sort of numbers in the future, but numbers now. The demographic makeup of our country shows there's little excuse of organizations not having diversity. The excuses of, well, none of them apply or they're just not interested is boom malarkey. However, black people and people of color also can't get placed and then stuck in the lowest rings of, rungs of an organization or be relocated to diversity and HR positions. There must be movement. Research shows that organizations that are diverse have more transparent processes. They should remove fit as a criteria for hiring. Fit is too often a code word for just like me. And in predominantly white organizations, black individuals too often lack that fit. And research also shows the power of structured interviews and blinded resumes on hiring more diverse individuals. There's a lot of talk about diversity training, bias training, and ally training. I strongly believe these should be empirically based and mandatory. We would never tell organizations that their safety trainings uh, can be optional. And I believe diversity and bias training is safety training for diverse individuals. Now, clearly, single session trainings are not and should never be seen as a panacea. Finally, organizational leaders should be in constant communication with their diverse workforce. They should participate in employee research, group, research groups and ensure that they're getting feedback from and listening to black employees. In conclusion, I want to say that the discomfort that many of you, many of us are feeling is important. It's really important. That is cognitive dissonance and it's what motivates us to act. And I urge each of you to respond by waging a war on racism. Indeed, black lives depend on it. Thank you so much for the presentation just now and also for being here with us today to have this conversation. Um, so the first question that we have is from um, Nihimaya Ankor. I hope I said that right. Um, so the question is, hi Nikki, uh, what's your opinion on Rice releasing a suspect's race in their crime, crime alerts? Uh, this feels problematic to me for many reasons, some of which you, Naomi, and Shannon articulated in one of your recent journal articles such as it does not lead to more arrests and increases subtle racial bias. At a predominantly white institution like Rice, uh, it feels particularly problematic to me since there is such a scarce population of black and Hispanic males on campus already. Uh, they become more likely to be profiled and seen as not belonging more than they already do. This feels like one specific policy that Rice could change to reduce racism in our community. What do you think? Well, um, thank you, Mai, for hosting this. And also, um, thank you, ne Nehemiah, for asking that question, because it's, uh, it's a, a wonderful question and one we have done research on. Um, I think if you think about the population and you realize there are a lot of Black men in our population, and you also think about the height of most men, which is 510 and you get a crime report where the only information that you receive is that there is a man who was somewhere around 510 and black who committed the crime. Um, you can think about one, how that is really unexceptional information and two, how it completely alerts everyone to any black man who is 5'10 to 6 feet tall, which is the average height. So essentially what many of these crime reports are doing is simply heightening our fear. If we only know that about the person, every black man in our area is suspect. 
And over the last 20 years, indeed, there have been some cases of students at Rice getting stopped by the campus police for unlocking their bike and have to show their ID. But that's not a Rice University problem. That's a problem on every campus. And these racial crimes are, uh, 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 the, these crime reports are a problem, not just at Rice, but nationwide as well. And so Naomi and I looked to see if there were, there was a link between adding these crime reports and actually um, finding the suspect. And it was hard to collect this data. What we can tell you is that we think it did a great deal more harm, and I'll tell you why in a second, than it actually helped. If there's very specific information, so again, sometimes they say, okay, there's a black man who is 5'10 and wearing a t-shirt. <laughs> it's like, oh my God. Uh, so we kind of have these like terrible crime report emails going back and forth because again, what you see is it's just heightening. But if there is something very specific, like, you know, they have these words or this is a, a tattoo or something that they have that's visible, it can be helpful for very immediately after the crime, that can be helpful. But what we know is that in general, it just alerts everybody's uh, stereotypes and uh, fears. We actually did a study where we had people come into the lab to do this. So not only did we collect data in the real world, but we had people come into the lab and there was a Confederate, which in Texas is not a a Confederate, it's a fake person in a study. And what they did is uh, the black person sat, um, well, first of all, the subject came in and saw a crime report. And that crime report um, said that there was a recent crime on campus and it was either conducted by a white individual or a black individual. And then very shortly after, another research participant came in who was either black or white. And then we um, coded, we, in, uh, we videotaped the interaction and we could see some signs of increased distress. I will tell you, we also had the black Confederate say to the white Confederate, I really like your laptop bag. And then the white individual was asked to leave their laptop in the hallway or in the room with the black individual and go into another room. And again, what we saw was some evidence of heightened alert when there was that crime report, only in the cases where that was the, there was that crime report. So what we were able to see is that that was priming people in ways that differentiated their treatment. So I think it's really important to think about what crime reports are doing more generally. And I would say it's really unhelpful when they're that generic. So um, the next question that we have is from Samantha Ding. How can organizations measure success when combating racial inequalities? Um, it can be easy to measure numbers of black students recruited, for example, but how can we measure their success after recruitment? Yeah, so I, this is an, a great question to Samantha, thank you. I think about something called the ASA model and it's by this um, researcher who basically says the people make the place. So um, an ASA stands for attraction, selection and attrition. And I think this is a really valuable model, especially when we're thinking about Blacks in our organization or at our institution. So yes, um, we can sometimes, first of all, we need to bring them in and there's lots of things we can do to increase the attraction. But your question is focused, once we get them in there, how can we make sure that we have success? And what I would say is then at that point, we're really thinking about the A is for attraction, S is for selection, and then the last A is for attrition. So how do we prevent them from leaving? 
And when we think about preventing them from leaving, I think the first thing we have to do is make sure that we really are supporting them. So I talk about diversity, inclusion, and authenticity when I teach my executive MBAs. So the diversity part is bringing them in, but the inclusion part is, are we doing something? Our job is not done once we recruit um, uh, people who are uh, what I call BIPOC. And what that means is we need to think about, are we really including them? And then are we letting them and celebrating and encouraging them to be authentic? So there's an article in the Harvard Business Review about the needs that many people from stigmatized groups and certainly Black people feel about covering. And it's about covering their stigmas, but also covering the way that they are really feeling about the workplace. So many people feel really awful and they don't feel included in their workplace, but they're afraid to acknowledge that. And I think what we need to do is really think about ways that we can help people be more authentic. That includes listening. So it's about really this metaphorical muting ourselves and really listening to the experiences that our Black colleagues are having. It means amplifying their voices. It means making sure that they have mentors, making sure that they have sponsors. And these aren't white knights who are the saviors. These are people who are saying, you know what? I know it's hard and I'm going to see you through this and I'm going to expend some of my blue chips to make sure you get through it. Not because, I, because the focus is on me, the focus is on you. And I think we can do other things like take metrics. So let's find out in surveys how those individuals feel. Let's do focus groups and find out what they need to be successful. So those are some of the things that I think lead to this more authentic and successful experience. People are able to, to see through them too. Like we can see the differences between optics, just saying, oh, we're a place that values diversity and bringing people in versus the people who really walk the walk and talk the talk. I think the next question, it's an extension of the earlier one, which is about the metrics um, trying to capture these qualitative experiences. Um, so this is from an anonymous attendee. Uh, great talk, thank you. Could you speak to any data or research on the effectiveness of the bias training and initiatives that are already mandatory at Rice? My question is really, are there any initiatives on campus that are showing results that we can do even more of? Um, yes and no. So first of all, um, there, is a, there are a lot of diversity consultants out there. And what I would say is um, it is much more complicated than just getting people together and teaching them about bias. That's really important. Learning about bias is so important. I sometimes teach executive MBAs and they say, I'm not biased. I, I hire women, I hire racial minorities. And I'm like, oh boy, <laughs> oh boy, we have our work cut out for us, okay? Um, what I would say is we've had a couple experiences to collect data ourselves. One was through O Week, so through Orientation Week uh, for first year students. About five or six years ago, we got the opportunity to go in and do experiments. Um, so in their O Week training, they have diversity uh, training. And so we worked with the diversity training coordinators and asked if we could have a little bit of that time. And we did some manipulations, and I'm going to tell you about the two manipulations that were the most successful, and I'll tell you how they were successful. The first one is to have people set goals on how they will be more anti-racist. So we actually had these individuals, these students, set goals on how they could be less biased, less prejudiced, less discriminatory against Blacks on campus. And so they had to write these goals down and they included things like be friend, don't laugh at jokes, uh, go to a black student association meeting. And then what we did is we looked at the attitudes that they had before they went to the training session, after they went to the training session at six months, and then after a year. 
And we looked at the actual behaviors that they engaged in too, to see if they were making good on their um, uh, goals. And what we found was their behaviors changed at time one, their attitudes did not. But at time two, their attitudes improved. And so what we think is happening is that if you can get people to behave, then their attitudes will follow. And it really tells you why policies are really important. Because if organizations and laws can pass these protective policies on how people behave, I often say, I don't care what people's attitudes are because we're all biased. So let's focus on their behavior because their attitudes will soon follow their behaviors. Another thing we found in the training that was super effective was um, something called perspective taking. And it's having them think for uh, a reflection period of time of things that they can do or of things that it would be good for them to do to consider another person's perspective. So in our case, what we did is we had them write about what it would be like to be a black person on our campus at Rice. And you can think about that for organizations or for other institutions as well. And that again was linked to increased attitudes and increased behavior. Another thing we did in another study was we looked at what happens when we do diversity training, but we don't just do diversity training for the individuals, we also do it for their management, for their managers. So what we know, and we did this also through O-Week by asking the O-Week advisors to take part as well. And you can think about this as in organizations, a lot of times we send the, the um, new people to get training, but it's never reinforced because the management hasn't taken part in it. So what we found is it's really important for the managers to take part in it too, so they know what they're referencing. And I would just say a really important thing to do is a needs analysis on the organization before diversity training is ever done. And what that means is the issues that we have at Rice University with respect to Blacks may not be the same issues that we have at University of Michigan or that we have at Anadarko or that we have at an architectural firm, okay? In some cases, there may just not be any. In some cases, they may be running out the door as soon as they can. In some cases, they may be happy in some aspects, but not in others. And so before we do this training, what we really need to do is understand what's going on in each of the organizations. And then finally, what I would say is we actually are doing this project with the University of Houston, where we're doing ally training. And there's some preliminary evidence that ally training is also super effective. And again, what it has to do with is finding out, first of all, before you do the ally training through focus groups, what are the black people within an organization experiencing? So we can't just go in and do diversity training without talking to them and figuring out what they find to be successful within this particular organization and what they find to not be successful. And what we find is when we can focus on that and then train other individuals to be allies, that's been successful. Um, so the last question we have is, how do you suggest minority students engage with their surround surroundings to improve on the current conditions of their learning or social environments without holding the burden or responsibility for educating peers or the school administrations? What is the shared responsibility for improving racial relations? And I wanted to tack on some of the other questions that's been coming up. And so what are some of the ways in which we can for instance, call out the subtle biases that's happening unintentionally amongst our peers, um, either as the directed uh, person or the recipient of that bias or as an observer, as a bystander. Um, how, how is it possible to have these kind of conversations that is uncomfortable? So thank you for that question too. Um, I first of all wanna say my email, as you can see, I think my name is showing up. It's H-E-B-L 
and it's my email is hebl at rice.edu. And because I'm a long winded talker, I'm so sorry. I am spending a lot of time on these questions. If I didn't get a chance to answer your question and you have it, I'll try to look at them on chat, but I don't have your email. So please email me your question and I will answer it. And I'll try to do that today. Um, this is another great question. And we actually have research that's funded by the NSF, by NSF that's looking at this exact question. Um, so first of all, I wanna say there are lots of strategies that minorities, that BIPOC, that, that Blacks can take, Black students can take to reduce the discrimination. I don't like to focus on those as much because it puts the burden on them. Although sometimes they say, yeah, but what can I do? And so there's strategies like acknowledging, um, there's strategies like uh, compensating, there's strategies like just bringing it out into the open. Um, and, and those are, 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 they can be very, very helpful. However, the, the point of what was in that question was exactly right. That's putting the burden on the victims. And what we really wanna do is take the burden off of the victims. So the answer to my last question, I think is sort of paramount is there's two sorts of things. One is allies. And so we're doing this research that's funded um, by NSF that looks at when whites hear um, BIPOC individuals or see or witness BIPOC individuals in STEM classes experience some subtle forms of bias, what do they do? And so we presented students with a number of scenarios and asked what would they do in these situations and do they recognize the uh, bias? And what I will tell you is sometimes they don't recognize the bias and it's pretty strong that they're not recognizing it, especially when it's subtle because we're all focusing on our own lives, not on, oh, how does my experience her every day? We're kind of stuck being sort of egocentric actors in a world where we're hit with all these pandemics and then all the stuff we gotta do today, right? So I can't go and think about, well, how's, what's my doing? So first of all, they're not recognizing it to a large extent. And then second of all, even when they do recognize it, they don't often think it's as bad because usually they just see one instance. And so they may say, my, you're taking that to, you know, they just meant it as a joke. And again, that's because I, Mickey Hebel, only saw one incident toward you. I didn't see the incident that you experience every hour or every day or whatever it is. And so what we're trying to do is get people to feel a little more responsibility about the bias, the subtle biases that they witness others experiencing. So in a sense, it's a little bit like ally training. And I think we need to do that. And then we also need to simply educate people. Like people, when they become aware, they say, wow, you know, I just didn't know that. In our lives, we are the protagonists. So it's hard for us to see, oh, we were actually did something really bad. But if we become aware of it and we're shown that and then told, well, this is how to do it better, we, education works. You know, and maybe that's coming from an educator and a good place to stop. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for your questions, everyone. Thank you so much, Maya. And thank you, um, Mickey, for your, your time, your labor, and the generosity of offering to answer these questions after the lecture. Um, and it was a really great talk. Um, and so to our audience, uh, please join us for the next noon talk on Wednesday, September 2nd, Architecture. It is what it is, but it does not have to be with Enzilla Gilmore. Um, I'd like to offer a virtual round of applause to, to Mickey. Um, and thank you all for coming. Uh, see you next week, hopefully. Bye-bye.